And now I'm sure our old friend Dr. Watson's ready for us, so let's go in and join him. Come in, come in, come in. Good evening, Mr. Bartow. Good evening, Doctor. <laughs> well, the puppies seem very happy tonight. Yeah, tonight, yes, but you should have seen them this afternoon. I doubt if there were two more frightened little dogs in the whole of California. Well, now, not to control yourself. What but, happened, Doctor? Well, I took him for a walk on the beach. As we were scrambling round a rocky point, a seal popped his head up in the water quite close to us. What did the puppies do? Oh, both of them barked at it furiously. And the seal? Blew a few bubbles and then barked right back. I don't know <laughs> what the world's speed record is for short-legged dogs, but I'm sure they broke it. <laughs> you know, Doctor, I'll have to join you on one of those afternoon strolls of yours. You always seem to be having such exciting adventures. Oh, and talking of that, how's about tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure? Well, I'm all ready for you, my boy. In fact, I was looking over my notes on the case just before you arrived. This is another story in which Sherlock Holmes' elder brother, Mycroft, played an important part. Mycroft Holmes was seven years older than Sherlock, and some said it is superior in powers of observation and deduction. That sounds like heresy, Doctor. No, 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 young fellow, my lad. Holmes himself was the first to admit it. In fact, if it hadn't been for his incurable laziness, Mycroft could have been a formidable rival to his younger brother. However, Mycroft did hold a position of considerable importance at the Foreign Office, and it was there. But tonight's story begins. It was in the winter of 1899, and Mycroft Holmes, after a gourmet's lunch, was reclining full length on a leather settee. His eyes were closed, his hands were folded across his stomach, and his breath came rhythmically. A cynic would have declared that Mycroft Holmes was taking an after luncheon snooze, that Mr. Holmes' secretary, a gentleman by the name of Gardner, was a realist. He tapped on the door discreetly. Then he rapped on it. And still there was no response, so he opened the door and entered. After a moment, he gave what he thought was a discreet cough. <coughs> Mycroft Holmes opened his eyes and folded his hands and said, Found it, Gardner. Must you come in here and bark at me so soon after lunch? I'm sorry, Mr. Holmes. But I thought that... You uh, thought that as I was lying down with my eyes closed that I must be bored. And so you came galloping in. Oh. Well, what do you want? There's an old lady outside, sir. She insists on seeing you personally. I've tried to get rid of her, but... What's her she... name? Mrs. Hudson, sir. Mrs. Hudson? Huh. Show her in, Gardner. Show her in. Very good, sir. Undoubtedly a message from young Sherlock. How are you, Mrs. Hudson? Oh, good day, Mr. Holmes. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I won't take up much of your time. Sit down, won't you? Don't leave us, Gardner. I may need you in a few minutes. Very good, sir. Now, Mrs. Hudson, what's the message? Message, sir? Didn't my brother send you with some message that he was afraid to entrust to the ordinary channels? He's always so confounded and dramatic. Oh, bless your heart. No, sir. I I've come to you with a little problem of my own. I didn't like to bother Mr. Sherlock Holmes with it. He's been so busy lately, and, and he's looking very tired. And so you came to me. Delightful. I thought you wouldn't mind, sir. You've always been so nice and friendly to me. Pure laziness. It is less effort to keep an old friend than to make a new enemy. But tell me your problem. Well, it, it's really my sister's problem, sir. She keeps a boarding house at 14 Kensington Garden Square in Bayswater. And she's convinced that one of her boarders, a, a man who has a room on the first floor back, she's convinced that he's a bird man. And what in heaven's name is a bird man? Do you know, Gardner? No, sir. I can't imagine. Oh, it's like a werewolf, gentlemen, except that the man turns into a bird. Oh, come now, Mrs. Hudson. Oh, I know it sounds daft, but my sister's in a dreadful state. Of course, I've been with your brother long enough, sir, to know that such things are nonsense. But how can I prove it to her? What reason does your sister give for holding her strange belief? She keeps finding pigeon feathers in the room. No, the man doesn't keep pigeons, sir. My sister knows that for a fact. Has she found any traces of scattered food on the window ledge? None, sir. No signs of any pigeons, except the feathers. My sister's a wee bit fey, Mr. Holmes. She's the seventh daughter of a seventh daughter, and you know what that means. Just the same, she's not imagining things, sir. She's shown me the feathers herself. Where were they, Mrs. Hudson? Somewhere on the floor by the end of the bedstead, sir. I, I brought some along with me. Yes, sir. And we found some more in the gentleman's cupboard where he keeps his clothes. By George, 
I wonder what if... What is it, sir? I'll tell you in a moment, Gardner. Uh, Mrs. Hudson, this matter will require a little private investigation. You may return to your sister and tell her not to worry. I shall get in touch with you as soon as my inquiries are completed. Good day to you. Good day, sir. And I'm very much obliged to you. Well, Gardner, what do you make of it? An old wives' tale, sir. You're not treating it seriously, are you? Yes, I am. One of these feathers shows evidence of having had string tightened round it. That suggests a captive bird. Now, a captive bird smuggled into an obscure boarding house would point to something of the greatest importance to us, Gardner. By George, sir. You mean carrier pigeons? Exactly. And remember that we're at war and that the Boers have obtained several important and highly confidential secrets of ours lately. We know there's a leak somewhere. This requires an active investigator who can work with discretion. Now, I could work with discretion, but uh, I don't feel too active at the moment. <laughs> ah, I have it. I want you to write this letter to my brother. Disguise your hand, use plain, cheap notepaper, and don't sign the letter. He won't be able to resist that combination. Are you ready, Gardner? Yes, sir. Very well, then. Uh, my dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, uh, we know of your proposed investigation of the tenant in the first floor back at uh, 14 Kensington Garden Square. We warn you, as you value your life, keep away from the <laughs> We warn you, as you value your life, to keep away from the case. And that, my dear Watson, is why we are driving towards 14 Kensington Garden Square, disguised as building inspectors of the London County Council. Well, I must say, it's a very challenging letter, Holmes. Unsigned, yes. I notice. Written on cheap notepaper and in a disguised hand. No clue there, I'm afraid. Well, we're, we're entering the square, Holmes. Yeah. Let's stop the cab here. Uh, you can drop us here, cabby. All right, you are, cab. Near him. It would seem a little incongruous in these costumes for us to arrive in a cab. Yes, I suppose so. Uh... Here you are, cabby. Oh, thank you, Governor. Supposing this mysterious tenant on the first floor back should be in his room when we get there. Then we must hope that our disguises are convincing and keep our wits about us. Now, this may be a trap. Yes, just what I was going to say. After all, you've never heard of 14 Kensington Garden Square until you received an unsigned letter two hours ago warning you to keep away from it. Don't like the look of it. There we are, number 14. I suggest that you let me do most of the talking. Good Lord, yes. My Cockney accent doesn't compare with yours. Who do you want to say? Uh, we're from the London County Council. We are. We've had complaints about a leaky gas jet in the uh, first floor back. Oh, that's Mr. Green's room. He ain't out. Oh, that don't matter, my dear. We'll go out and take a look. Come on, Bertie. Right, right. You are, Alfie. Want me to show you the way? The missus is out, shall No, thanks, dearie. Me and Bertie can't get lost, can we, Bertie? Oh, of course we can't. <laughs> of course we can't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at him laughing. <laughs> uh, come on, Bertie. Oh, uh, I do not to be beside the seaside. Oh, uh, I do not to be beside the sea. Tiddly um pa pum pa pum, tiddly um pa pum pa pum. Nice ass, Bertie, ain't it? Yes, Elf. Nice ass can be, this ass. Oh, I do not to be beside the same side there. Uh, I do not to be beside us. There we are. First book back. Better make sure the bloke ain't home. Oh, I do not to no, be no, beside us. No, no, ain't home, Alfie. Huh? No, well, all right. Let's go in. Well, this is the mysterious room, eh? Well, that looks perfectly ordinary, doesn't it? Yes, a depressing example of the squalor of boarding house life. Hello. What's this on the bedspread? Feathers. Must have come out of the pillow. No. He's a pigeon step, this old chap. And look here, Watson. Attached to the bed rail. Well, that's only a piece of string. String, yes, but... A small metal ring on the end. A ring such as is used to place around a homing pigeon's leg. But why should someone keep carrier pigeons in an obscure boarding house like this? Yes, why indeed, why indeed. The answer could be that the tenant of this room is engaged in some sinister activity that requires the use of carrier pigeons in sending messages. Yes, there's no evidence of the birds being kept here. That's true, old fellow, that's true. Uh, possibly the owner of this room is given, to, is given a pigeon by one of his superiors, brings it here, affixes his message, and releases the bird. Well, why couldn't he just take the message to where they keep the birds? Well, in that way, he would run the risk of being picked up with uh, dangerous and incriminating messages on well, What kind of skullduggery involves the use of carrier pigeons, you suppose? We're at the war with the Boers in South Africa, Watson. 
What could be more logical than that a spy in their pay should be using this method to smuggle important information out of the country? Right, cheer for yourselves. I wouldn't mind betting... Shh! Somebody coming. Look out. Who are you? What the devil do you think you're doing in my room? Well, my name's Bertram and I come here to look at your gas pipes. No, don't lie to me. Who are you? It's like I say, Gabriel. My name's Bertram and I come from the London County Council. Uh, very well, then. If you won't tell me the truth, perhaps this revolver will make you change now, your look mind. Look here, Gabriel. Look it's here, Gabriel. Oh. Right. Uh, grab his revolver, Watson. Yes, right. Holmes, where were you? I slipped behind the door as this gentleman opened it. Yeah, me, sir. Your overcoat the coat seems extraordinarily well filled with chest, doesn't it? Why not slip it off? Yeah. It's a bit warm in here. Ah, oh, let me alone. Right. Joe, we, you were right, Holmes. He had a pigeon under his coat. Uh, yes, see if you can catch the bird, will you, old chap? All right, here. Come on, Pidgey. Pidgey, come on. Come on, little fella. Come along, Pidgey. There he comes. That's it. <laughs> look at the little fella. Snuggled up on my arm. Friendly little fellow, isn't he? Yes, I... Look out, Watson. The gentleman's revolver. Yes, going and when I get it, I'll... Oh. A beautiful uppercut, Holmes. I'm, uh... I'm afraid he'll be unable to talk to us for some time. How fortunate he told us where the message was hidden before we indulged in this little set, too. What do you too. mean? Did you say anything about a message? No, not verbally. But I was watching his reflection in the mirror as he entered the room. His eyes first glanced at this top drawer on the dresser here to see if we touched it. It was obviously the most important spot in the room. Let's see. Ah, here we are. A message already rolled up and in its container. Oh? What does it say, Holmes? It's in code, which is not surprising, but I don't think it will be very difficult to decipher. Yes, and when you've done that? Then, my dear fellow, I shall compose a code message of my own and persuade this pigeon to lead us to its master. I can see from your puzzled expression, Watson, that you're wondering why I brought you to Dexter's Music Hall in the Edgware Road. Well, I must confess, I'm a little confused, Holmes. First of all, we go to Baker Street and you spend hours poring over some obscure book. Then you write out a message, attach it to a pigeon and let it loose. Now you bring me here. I hate to question you when you're working, but I should be glad if you'd give me some idea of what's going on. Of course, old chap. At times, I must seem confoundedly mysterious, I'm sure. Here's the situation. The obscure book I was studying was a table of ciphers. I was trying to decode the message we found in the room on the first floor well, back. Well, obviously you succeeded or we wouldn't be here. Yes, the key word was Louis Botha, the name of the Boer leader. The message was a report on the number of troops now in training at Aldershot. Then you were right. We're mixed up with a ring of enemy agents. Obviously, old chap. So I kept the original message and composed another using the same code and dispatched it by carrier pigeon. Well, what did you say in your message? Meet me tonight, 8 o'clock, table number 3 at Dexter's Music Hall. What made you choose this place as a rendezvous? Well, I happen to know that it's a common meeting place for underworld characters. <laughs> And which is table number three? The one over there in the corner. I reserved it. Then why don't we go and sit down there instead of standing it here at the back? I it? thought we'd give our visitor the opportunity of showing his hand first. He won't be expecting Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, I fancy. <laughs> Good Lord, look at this woman coming on to sing. You ever see so many feathers? I'm not allowed to have a bow except upon the fly. So yesterday he came and took me walking through the Holmes, Holmes, look, look. A man just sitting down at table number three. What's my luck? Sid Trimble. Sid Trimble, who's he? A dangerous criminal who once worked for the Moriarty gang. We've caught a prize pigeon, Watson. Better have your revolver handy, old chap. Undoubtedly, he'll recognize us. Right, you are home. Come on, then. I'm so glad you're able to keep your appointment, sir. Sherlock Holmes, this is a trap. Ah, oh, don't try any tricks. I've got a revolver here, Sid. How'd you like this table in your face? <laughs> Watson, you didn't shoot him, did you? No, no, he knocked my hand. The revolver went off. I, the shot went wild. I swear it did. Yes, of course. Look at the wound. 
There are no powder burns. The shot was fired from some distance. Holmes. Holmes, he's... He's dead. Out of the way. Out of the way, please. Now then, what's going on here? Uh, Constable, this man has been killed. Yes, and it's easy to see who did it. Well, I didn't do it, Constable, if that's what you're thinking. No? Then why are you standing here with a smoking revolver in your hand? Come on, you. You're under arrest. But you can't arrest me. I'm Dr. Watson, and this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes. I don't care if you're the King of Siam and the Bishop of London himself. You're under arrest, and I'm taking you both to Scotland Yard. <laughs> You'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a second. And if you don't mind, I'll take that second to say just one word to the ladies. And that word is muscatel. Petri California muscatel. I want you women to know about it because Petri muscatel is one wine that practically every woman likes. Maybe because it's such a beautiful color. Like, well, like pale gold. But I guess really because Petri Muscatel brings you the wonderful flavor of luscious, sun-ripened Muscat grapes. And that's a flavor. Try Petri Muscatel after dinner or any time as a change from Petri Port. Have a bottle of each on hand. When you buy Petri wine, don't buy one, buy two. Remember, if it's a Petri wine, you know it's a good wine. Dr. Watson, that was really one for the books. So you got yourself arrested on a murder charge. Yes, Mr. Bartell. It's a very humiliating experience. I was taken off to Scotland Yard in the Black Marais. Just like any common criminal. The wretched constable wouldn't listen to a word that I'd got to say. Well, Sherlock Holmes went with you, of course. Naturally. But as we arrived at Scotland Yard, my mortification was complete. And I found that I was led into the presence of our old friend, Inspector Lestrade. Holmes spoke to him at some length, but I could see from Lestrade's expression... My position was uh, very serious. I can see uh, what it is, Mr. Holmes. You see, I know you both. But I must say there are lots of them here at the yard as don't like what they call your eye-handed method. But, Lestrade, personal likes or dislikes have nothing to do with this. No, no, of course they haven't. This is purely a matter of evidence. Well, I know that, Dr. Watson. And the constable's evidence was as clear as the nose on your face. The dead man was shot through the head. And you were standing in front of the body with a drawn revolver but in your hand. But my dear Lestrade, my dear Lestrade, there were no powder burns on the wound. Yeah, that's what you tells me, Mr. Holmes. But I'll have to wait for the official report on that. The police surgeon's examining the body now. You understand, gentlemen, I'm not saying I'm sorry that uh, Sid Trimble's dead. He's been a thorn in our side for a good many years. In fact, I... Oh, here's the uh, police surgeon now. Uh, Dr. Hendricks, uh, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and uh, Dr. Watson. How do you do? How do you do, do, gentlemen? I'm a great admirer of you both, and I'm sorry to see you in such a very unfortunate plight. Thank you, thank you, Doctor. What were your findings, Dr. Hendricks? Well, I just extracted the bullet, Lestrade, and I'm very much afraid it's the same make and caliber as the one missing from Dr. Watson's revolver. Yes, but that doesn't prove that I fired the fatal shot. A forty-five Colt's a very common weapon, Doctor. It proves nothing. Uh, Dr. Hendricks, as I was just saying to Inspector Lestrade before you came in, the only fact that would show my friend guilty would be powder burns on the wound, thereby giving, <coughs> proving that the bullet had been fired from close range. I entirely agree with you, Mr. Holmes. Uh, then, uh, as there were no powder burns oh, on the... Oh, but there are powder burns, Mr. Holmes. What? Very distinct ones, too. Lord, I... Uh, well, uh, I just... I don't understand, Holmes. I'm sorry, gentlemen, huh? to be the bearer of bad tidings, but... I have my duties to perform. Yes, and I'm sorry too, Dr. Watson. Huh? I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to let you leave here. You must consider yourself under arrest. Holmes, I never felt more despondent in my life. Oh, cheer up, old chap. Well, how can I? Locked up in a prisoner's cell. Looks as if I might end up at the gallows. Don't worry, Watson. You'll be out of here before the night is over. I promise you that. I wish I felt as confident as you do. How do you propose to do it? All with the aid of a little hard thinking. Thinking? (laughs) That won't unlock any cell doors. Thinking. But it will, old fellow. It's obvious someone's deliberately trying to incriminate us. Try and reconstruct killing logically. Hmm? Ted Trimble was a member of an espionage ring. I sent him a false message. 
After he'd uh, left to keep the appointment, one of his colleagues trailed him to the music hall and killed him before he could betray anything to us. Yes. Yes, that's undoubtedly the way it happened. The powder burns, Holmes. How do you count for them? There were none just after the shop was fired. We know that. And yet Dr. Hendricks assures us that there are very distinct powder burns now. May we come in, gentlemen? Yes, yes, of course you can, Dr. Hendricks. Oh, hello, Lestrade. Yes, I thought we'd come and uh, chat with you, Doctor. Well, that's, that's very nice of you, gentlemen. Yeah, not a bit of it, Doctor. You know, it, it hurts me to see you in here, and that's a fact. And I can't bear to see a fellow medico in such plight without coming in to see what I can do to help, Watson. Yeah. You're very quiet, Mr. Holmes. Am I, Lestrade? I was thinking, you see... Uh... Watson, old chap! I have it. You have what? The answer. You'll sleep in Baker Street tonight after all. Mr. Holmes, what are you talking the about? The murder of Sid Trumbull. The incriminating powder burns were obviously faked. Watson and I know that, whether you and Dr. Hendricks believe it or not. The question is, how were they faked? I think I have the answer. Uh, Dr. Hendricks. Yes, Mr. Holmes? If a blank cartridge were fired at the wound after death, it would produce powder burns, wouldn't it? Undoubtedly. Yeah, but uh, who could have done that, Mr. Holmes? Ah, that's the point, Lestrade. Who had the opportunity? The constable who brought the body here. True, old chap. Huh? Also, you, Dr. Hendricks. That's perfectly true. Yeah. Well, I had the opportunity, too, Mr. Holmes. I spent half an hour in the morgue alone with the body when it first came in. Well, you've narrowed it down to three suspects, Holmes. I hope I don't hang before you find the real killer. I found him, Watson. Why, what? who is he, Mr. Funny. Holmes? The answer is simple, Lestrade. The powder burns were certainly faked by a blank cartridge. Now, if a blank cartridge were fired into a wound, the uh, wadding would have penetrated and distorted the wound. Yes, but supposing the person had removed the wadding from the blank, Mr. Holmes? Its effect would still be quite apparent to the police surgeon who removed the bullet. Am I correct, Dr. Hendricks? Entirely. A surgeon could not fail to identify the marks, Mr. Holmes. Exactly. Uh, therefore, only one person could have fired that blank cartridge without detection. The same person who made the incision necessary to remove the cartridge would also remove all traces of the shot. You yourself, Dr. Hendricks. Thank you, Holmes. I believe you're right. <laughs> That's an ingenious theory, Holmes. Surely you're joking. Am I? Then how do you account for the pigeon fellow's feathers on the collar of your coat? Uh, um, the devil with you, Holmes. Here, here. Come back here. Uh, doctor. Uh, uh, constable. Come back, Dr. Hendricks. Hey, Great Scott. Scotland Yard itself harboring an enemy agent. <laughs> on my soul, Holmes. You've done it again. I must say you've got sharp eyes. I didn't see those pigeon feathers on, on Hendricks' collar. Uh, confidentially, my dear fellow, neither did I, but Hendricks' guilty conscience knew they might be there. It was a shot in the dark, and I had to take it. If you'd spent the night in, in a prison cell, I should never have heard the end of it, I'm sure. Never. I want to see Mr. Mycroft Holmes, please. Uh, follow me, Mrs. Hudson. He's expecting you. Aye, sir. Ah, there you are, Mrs. Hudson. Come and sit down. Oh, thank you, sir. I, I got your message and came over right away. In the first place, Mrs. Hudson, you may tell your sister that she needn't worry any more. I'm sure she'll find no more pigeon feathers in her room on the first floor back. No, sir, thank you. But she knows the fact... It, because the bird man left her yesterday for good. Some strange men came and took him away. And today, she's let the room to a nice young commercial traveler. I, I'm really sorry to have bothered you with her trouble, sir. I'm very glad you did, Mrs. Hudson. Thanks to your information, an enemy espionage ring has been broken, and the British government is deeply grateful to you. <laughs> you're always one for a joke, aren't you, Mr. Holmes? Well, I'm glad you're not angry with me. I'll be going now, sir. Just one more favor I'll ask before I go, though. Anything, Mrs. Hudson. What is it? Please don't tell your brother about this, sir. He'd be so angry with me for wasting your time. Well, Doctor, that was really a swell story tonight. Although it was a bit unexpected for you to have been arrested. Yes, indeed. Mr. Bartell, uh, when you're a detective like uh, like Holmes or a, a doctor like myself, well, you've got to be prepared to meet the unexpected 
every once in a while. Mm, I suppose so. Of course, you wouldn't know about things like that, being a, a wine expert yourself. Oh, now, wait a minute, Doctor. From the way you talk, you'd think I spent every waking moment in a nice, cool wine cellar, tasting wine from morning till night. Well, don't you? <laughs> oh, now, Doctor, <laughs> I'm no more a wine expert than you are. All I know about wine is it, it either tastes good or it doesn't. And I know that Petri wine does taste good. And that's because the Petri family took time to make good wine. Generations of time. Why, the Petri family has been making wine ever since they started the Petri business way back in the 1800s. And since the business has always been family-owned and operated, they've been able to hand on down from father to son, from father to son, all they've ever learned about the fine art of turning luscious, sun-ripened grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. And they've learned plenty. So no matter what type of wine you want, for any occasion, you can't go wrong with a Petri wine because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what story do you have lined up for us next week? Well, now, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you a weird adventure that Sherlock Holmes and I had in the east end of London. It concerns the most unusual stage play, a badly frightened actor and a blood-stained razor. I call it the strange case of the demon barber. <laughs> My roommate is into some weird fairy shit. And these aren't cute little human dragonflies with flower petals for clothes and sweet smiles. I don't know about you guys, but when I think of fairies, I'm picturing something like Tinkerbell. Yeah, I know, she's technically a pixie. Sue me. That is not the shit my roommate is fucking with. I noticed she was weird when I moved in. She was advertising for a roommate on Craigslist. She'd need someone who was open-minded, who was all right with strange people coming and going at all hours, who wouldn't ask questions about things that didn't involve them, and who would be okay with sharing a bathroom. Yeah, okay, not ideal, but I didn't need ideal. I needed livable, and honestly, I didn't really give a shit what she did in her spare time. Hell. She could have been cooking meth in her room as long as she didn't get me involved in her drug deals. I wouldn't have given a shit. Turns out she wasn't dealing drugs. Unless she was sharing marijuana with her deadbeat friends or something. Instead, she was into the occult. Supernatural stuff. Conspiracy theories. She believes in anything and everything. She's convinced she's seen Bigfoot. She was abducted by aliens when she was ten years old. She doesn't get vaccines because the government is using them to control people's minds. That kind of stuff. Is it terrible for me to say that I kind of like her? I mean, let's make no mistake here. She's fucked in the head, but she's actually a really good roommate. Pays her bills on time, cleans up after herself, asks me before having her weird gatherings and rituals and shit. Whenever she buys groceries, she grabs my favorite candy bar for me. And at least she's interesting. I'd rather sit and talk to her for an hour than listen to Nancy from work describe her latest MLM adventures. And before you argue with me, Stella, that's the name my roommate chose for herself, I guess, doesn't vote, so it's not like her weird-ass opinions and beliefs hurt anyone else. She told me once she thinks that if you enter a voting booth, the government will put you to sleep, embed your skin with a mind-reading chip, and release you back into society and you won't have any memory of what happened, and that it happened to her mum, and that's why her mum believed in evolution. Right. Anyway, so life with Stella wasn't terrible. We got along okay for the most part, and we managed to live together for six months before her weirdness started getting a little too close for comfort. What do I mean by that? Well, one morning I woke up to mold, growing in a ring in our living room. Seriously, it was a huge ass ring. Our living room is actually pretty sizable, especially since Stella doesn't believe in furniture, so it's particularly empty except for her weird candles everywhere. It never bothered me, since I don't use the common spaces much anyway. But mold, 
growing in my apartment was definitely not okay. Stella, what the hell is this? I asked. Stella was sitting at the edge of it, a mountain of books next to her. I saw a few titles straight away. Myths of the Fey Folk, Fairies and Other Creatures, The Magical Arts. In her hands was a book on botany, which was extremely peculiar in the moment, but not so much in hindsight. It's a fairy ring. At least it will be, she said, a small frown on her petite lips as she poured over her book. I bit back the urge to scream. I don't know what a fairy ring is, but I'm pretty sure it doesn't belong in our fucking living room. If you don't get it out of here, so help me God. Stella sighed and put her book down. I thought you'd say that. She said, reaching to the black messenger backpack at her side and pulling out a slightly crumpled envelope. She always had that bag on her, and I often saw her pull out any number of weird things from it, so you can understand that I was a little hesitant to take the envelope from her. But I did, and I opened it, and immediately, my frayed nerves were soothed. Five hundred dollars in cash will do that to a person. For the inconvenience, she said, going back to her book without a second glance at me. And if we get in the trouble with the landlord, I'll pay for any damages. I knew our landlord wouldn't bother coming around and checking. He didn't give a shit what anyone did in those apartments, anyway. So I was more than happy to let it slide, as long as that shit didn't start growing in my room. I did wonder where she got all that money, though. Stella was never short on cash, even though she didn't have a job, at least not that I could tell. Oh well, never look a gift horse in the mouth. I shrugged my shoulders and let it go. That night before I went to bed, I googled fairy rings. I only read for about five minutes before I got bored and gave up on it. Do you know how much has been written about these things? Too fucking much. Anyway, I figured out two very important things. First, many cultures believe that fairy rings are caused by fairies or pixies dancing in a circle. Second, mortals absolutely should not fuck with them. Now, I wasn't worried. Not only did I not believe in fairies, but I was also pretty sure you couldn't just grow your own fairy ring. I figured that Stella would lose interest in it after a few weeks, like she always did with her random obsessions, and then she'd get rid of it and life would continue as normal. Before that had a chance to happen, however, the fairy ring grew. After a few days, it had sprouted mushrooms, I shit you not. Literal mushrooms were growing in my living room. Stella seemed overjoyed with this arrangement. I was pretty grossed out because our room was starting to smell damp and musty and just gross. I really wanted to yank up that carpet and scrub all that nasty crap away, but I focused on the $500 I was getting for being cooperative and tried to will away my annoyance. Stella's excitement grew over the next few days until it spilled over into the few conversations we had. It's almost ready. They'll be here soon. I can feel it, she said one night when we were having a beer. She was sitting in the middle of the circle while I stayed far outside it, not out of superstition, but because I wasn't going near the nasty thing. Are you sure that's how it works? I asked. My skepticism must have been obvious because her response was just on this side of indignant. I've done my research, Janice. It's like that movie. What was it? If you build it, they will come. Just like that. I've made the ring... They won't be able to resist dancing on it. That's just how it works. I wasn't convinced, but... Ah, oh, hell. Why not? It's not real anyway, so who cares how she thinks it works? So what happens afterwards? She looked confused. After what? After the fairies show up. I said, what happens? Do you talk to them? Trap them? Ask them to grant you a wish? What? She stared at me in utter bewilderment for a second, and then burst out laughing. <laughs> God, Janice, you're so funny sometimes, she said. I chose not to press the point. Instead, I finished my beer and went to bed. Things played out about how I expected over the next week or so. Stella was obsessed with her fairy ring. 
I cycled between ignoring it and indulging her. Eventually, her interest started to wane, and she began to turn her attention to other things. I noticed a few books on the Jersey Devil appearing around the apartment, so I figured that's what would plague my life next. I felt like I was living in some sort of sitcom. And then, three weeks go by. Something different happened. I woke up around four in the morning, my sleep disturbed by a strange blue glow coming from under my door. I stumbled out of bed, rubbing the sleep from my eyes as I went in search of the light source. As soon as I entered the living room, I was almost blinded by the blue light assaulting my eyes. I swore to myself as I shielded my face, trying to let my eyes adjust. Eventually, they did, and I was able to take in the terrible sight that awaited me. Stella, naked, dancing on the fairy ring. Her body twisted and jerked, almost like she was being pulled along. She stumbled, but didn't fall, going round and round so quickly it made me dizzy. I started to walk towards her, confused and somewhat unsettled. Was she on acid or something? I almost just went back to my room and pretended I hadn't seen anything. But then, the blood caught my attention. It oozed from small cuts all over her body. A ring of blood was crusted around her wrists. Slashes across her abdomen resulted in red rivets, tracing paths down her legs. Finally, I saw her face. Her eyes were fixed on me, and a shudder worked its way down my spine. Her face was twisted in agony, her mouth a grimace, her eyes red with tears. Snot was running out of her nose. She was heaving for breath, and I was sure, so sure I saw her scream. Except there was no sound. Nothing at all. I couldn't hear the sound of cars passing by on the road outside, the sound of her feet on the carpet, the sound of her breathing. It was like I was trapped in a vacuum. But then again, I didn't really need to hear what she was screaming. I could read it on her lips like the words had been printed there. Help me, help me, help me, help me. My body responded to a silent plea and I lunged at her, hand outstretched, intent on wrenching her from the circle. But just then, she disappeared vanished in front of my eyes as though she'd never been there. I tripped and fell to my knees, just outside the ring of glowing blue mushrooms that dotted the floor. Slowly, before my eyes, the glow faded to nothing until I was alone in the dark, just me, the silence, and the knowledge that Stella was not coming back. I called the police, of course. That's what you do, right? I'd never been in a situation quite like that before. I knew I couldn't tell them what I saw, so I just told them that when I woke up, she was gone, and that was rare for her. That I was worried something had happened. They declared her missing. I steered clear of the living room. I wanted to get out of there as fast as humanely possible, so I booked a hotel room until I managed to find another place. I didn't give a shit about breaking the lease or forfeiting the security deposit on the apartment. I just wanted out. I got a place pretty quickly, a real dump of a studio apartment, but it's affordable, and built up my courage to go back to our apartment to pack up my few things and go. When I opened the door, God, no matter how long I live, I'll never forget this. When I opened the door, she was there, lying there, in the middle of the fairy ring. The cuts had deepened into permanent grooves in her body. She was thinner than before, and as though someone had sucked the flesh out of her, tightened her skin until it was tough and leathery. In fact, she almost looked like she'd been mummified. Her eyes were gone. Her teeth were gone. Her mouth was still gaping open, still screaming for someone, me, to help her. And as I stared at the body, I swear to God, I heard a faint giggle coming from somewhere in the apartment. I think I'm done with roommates for a while. God's Mouth I huffed and puffed under my breath. 
as I stared into God's mouth. I felt like the big bad wolf, ready to interrupt the three innocent little pigs as they hurriedly fortified their makeshift homes. I grinned at this thought and then turned my head to look for Margaret. She was a couple of feet down the hill from the entrance of the cave, holding a walking stick close to her petite breasts. Hurry up! I called down to her. I turned back to the cave, still grinning. An old, rotted sign outside read, God's Mouth Cave. Keep out. What a tired cliché. Margaret finally made it to the entrance and stood beside me, almost doubled over and out of breath. I looked down and smiled. Check it out. <laughs> I laughed. God's Mouth. Wonder where Jesus' anus is. <laughs> I chuckled to myself. Margaret was less amused. Give me the damn water bottle, she said, exasperated. The open bottle met her lips, and for a moment I felt peaceful, in a way, watching her drink the water. Actually, I take that back, the peaceful comment, I mean. It was more of a feeling that was sort of hard to put my finger on or give a name, but I could settle for a nice content. Content seemed to be one of those words that manifest itself when natural human words seem to fail. Again, an utter cliché, but it felt good to feel a strange, mixed-up sort of happy for once. I sighed and turned my flashlight on. I pointed it into the cave. Black. God's mouth. This seemed like the antithesis of a Holy Spirit. I turned again to Margaret. You ready? I asked. She was finally standing straight up. She nodded. I clapped a friendly hand to her back and we walked into God's mouth. The inside was not unlike the preview I had glimpsed outside with my flashlight. Dark, dismal, and endlessly black. It seemed to stretch endlessly, no matter how I positioned my flashlight. The rocky terrain was damp and imposing. The last natural light slowly disappeared behind Margaret and I as we made our way deeper and deeper. I found it strange how soft and compelling the world around me now appeared, despite the stalactites, stalagmites, and other various rocky formations being so jagged. It seemed that even amongst the pointed teeth of God, I could lay down and rest there forever. It was comfortable. Apparently, Margaret didn't agree. She shivered uncomfortably under my arm. I raised my eyebrows. Need your coat? I asked. I tried to look at her and make non-verbal communication as explicit as possible until I realized that we were lost in the inky blackness of the mouth. I bit my lip and waited, but she didn't respond. For a couple of minutes, we walked in silence. She stopped and stood motionless. I stopped too. Why the hell are we even in here? She said. She sounded irritated. I shrugged, more to appease myself than her, and shoved my flashlight under my face. Bladed shadows obscured half my face, the other half illuminated in a wretched mask. Spooky! <laughs> I cried, chuckling. She didn't move. I sighed. I thought you wanted to go. I said. I noticed how my voice echoed against the cave walls at any volume. I mean... I began again, scratching at my chin. You did say you wanted to go see some nature for our vacation. And you did sound impressed when I told you about my visit to Mammoth Caves a couple of years back. So... My voice trailed off. I could still sense her irritation. No. She said. I frowned. No, you wanted to go here. I wanted to go to the beach or something, but no. A cave? A cave, Nathan? She sounded more like the big bad wolf now. I know that you have this weird fetish for spelunking or something, but I don't really want to be dragged into it. Don't get me wrong, I do love to go on a trip and get into nature and fresh air, but this? I could hear her arms flail and gesture about in the thick air. This is cave air, not fresh air. This air is practically fermenting. Plus... Isn't this illegal? Can we please just leave? 
we both stood there. The only sound that could be heard was the electricity in the air being stifled and smothered by the damp atmosphere. Finally, I began to walk. I didn't hear Margaret follow me, but I kept moving forward. Then, Nathan, she said, stop, please stop. So I stopped. I'm sorry, she said. I could hear her moving close to me. I'm tired, and I'm not used to running and climbing around and the like. I'm just tired. It's okay, I said. She gripped my arm. Really, it's fine. I shook my head. Which way is out? I don't remember. I could feel Margaret physically pause. Neither of us could remember. Somehow, in the confusion of our argument, I'd forgotten which way we'd been moving. Idiot, I thought to myself. I should have brought a goddamn rope or something to trail from the entrance of the cave. I had to take action. So without much thought, I turned 180 degrees and said, This way. We walked for what seemed to be hours. My feet were tired and sore, and I could hear Margaret's groans from behind me. She held my hand tightly. I felt terrible. This was my fault. Then I froze. Hey, hey, I said. Put your hand out. Feel this rock. I could hear Margaret's bare palm press against the stone. Isn't this, like, abnormally warm? I said. She didn't say anything. I began to work my way along the wall, feeling it as I went, shining the flashlight in front of me. Suddenly, I felt a sharp pain on my head as the ceiling of God's mouth met with my scalp. Ow! Shit! I shouted. Oh, Nathan, are you okay? Margaret asked. She seemed on the verge of panic now. I'm fine, I said. Please calm down. We'll get out of here soon, I promise. I started again, pointing my flashlight upward now to see the ceiling above me. It seemed to be getting narrower. That was strange. Listen, uh, Margaret, babe. I said through clenched teeth. I think we gotta turn around. Margaret sighed next to me. Again, we walked for a decent length. I kept my flashlight pointed upwards this time. Sure enough, the space in the cave seemed to become smaller and smaller. If there was any resonating light left in God's mouth aside from my flashlight, I'm sure Margaret would have been able to see the whites of my eyes, spreading in panic. We were completely lost. I let go of Margaret's hand and began to feverishly feel my way along the walls. No, Nathan! I heard her shout. I kept going. We had to get out. If we were lost, nobody would be able to find us. I kept feeling along the wall until I abruptly hit a corner. Fuck! I said aloud. Margaret, this seems to be a dead end. I spun around on my heel. Margaret? No answer. Shit. I began to repeat my process again, almost running as I felt the wall run past my fingertips. Cool, damp rocks and jagged spears. Suddenly, I found myself at a corner again. Fuck, fuck, fuck! I shouted. Margaret! I was belting her name out now. In the corner of the cave's moor, where I'd been thwarted so many times already, I heard a noise. It sounded like muffled static from a television. I pressed my ear against the rock. It seemed to be getting even warmer now. I heard the faint sounds of Margaret on the other side of the rock. She was screaming. No, no, no. I said. No, 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 no. I began running haphazardly into the walls around me. With dawning realization came a wave of sheer horror. There was no entrance. There was no exit. Only these four corners and me. I could feel blood begin to trickle from the cut I managed to get by bashing my body into the cave's walls. They were closing in on me. They were coming in for the kill, and soon they would be pressing in on my skull and crushing my ribcage. I sat there for hours, waiting for death. My flashlight was becoming dim and blinking. Finally. I felt the soft touch of these rocky walls pressed against my back. I began to cry as I lay down on the ground. I let my flashlight roll on the small hills of stone. As I quietly stayed prone, tears dripping down my face, 
I turned and looked at the flashlight. Its last, fading beams of light pointed at something not far away from my face. I squinted in the darkness. My eyes widened and I felt tears fall even harder from my face. The rocks were piercing my skin now and blood dripped from all sides. There, in the last light of my flashlight, was the appetizer. The spotlight shone on a hand whose nails were painted red. And I screamed in agony as I watched God's mouth chew its latest meal. The Baseball Boy If you can, try and find Queen Elizabeth Elementary School, a place notable for its spacious schoolyard and aged brick building. Go to this school's playground on a Sunday evening, any time between 6.25pm and 6.45pm, and optionally, you can only bring one object with you. It can be a bike, your means of getting there perhaps, or a camera, but nothing that could distract you from your surroundings. You will fail to get far if you are not focused on the schoolyard. Go to the swing set and pick the last swing on the right, and swing. Optionally, you could simply sit on it, but the process could take much, much longer. If everything is going correctly, you should see a child's form walking the perimeter of the grounds, waving a black bat. Do not stare for too long, or he will notice and run out of the yard. At that point, you have an unknown amount of time to get as far away as you can from the school before he comes back. Continue swinging long enough and you'll hear him call out to you, heading towards you slowly from behind. Only look back at him once or twice at first, but as he gets closer, he will ask your name. Under no circumstances should you ever reveal your name to him, as he'll ask you more and more questions that you'll be forced to answer. He'll remember everything you tell him, and while he is not able to hurt you with this, he likes to tell his friends everything about the people he meets. Instead, just tell him politely that your name isn't important. He'll at first ask you from afar if you ever played baseball. Then the boy will stop beside the swing set. You'll notice he's approximately seven with a blonde buzz cut and oversized camouflage print hoodie, and he's chewing on some sort of stick. You will not have enough time to identify what it is, but it had been described as a coffee stir stick or even a long nail. This is when he'll ask you if you want to play baseball. This is the last chance you'll have to leave. If you must, tell him that you aren't good at baseball or maybe that you need to go home for dinner. The boy will try to persuade you to stay and maybe even offer to teach you to play. But turn him down politely and promise him that other children usually come to the ground around that time. Leave and head straight to your destination. If you do choose to play baseball with him, he will not seem excited at first, but lead you straight to the baseball diamond on the other end of the yard. He may not say much, but mention that he's been looking for people to play with him for a while. His game of baseball, as it turns out, involves you throwing a ball to him, and he'll hit it with his bat and then run around the diamond. You'll repeat this over and over again, and it isn't known how long it could take until the boy will be contented. It could be anywhere from 10 minutes to 3 hours. If at any time you try to leave the game prematurely, he will try and persuade you to stay. You'll notice a different look in his eyes. And looking directly into them will give you a burning feeling in your skull. Giving him an excuse or even staying will have no effect. And at this point, the best thing you could do for yourself is to run onto the adjacent street and throw yourself in front of a car lest you experience what the boy will do to you. But play baseball with the boy all the way to the end, and he'll come up to you overjoyed. He'll thank you for your time and give you the baseball. From there, he'll take his bat and go home, and you're free to leave, too. But exit in the opposite direction and do not turn around at all until you have left the grounds. When you reach a safe place indoors, you will now be able to study the ball. There's nothing about it that appears odd. It's simply a battered old baseball. You can either display it or even play with it, but try stripping a small piece off the ball and carrying it around in your pocket. You may experience headaches at first, but you'll notice a change in yourself afterwards. You'll be able to predict any accidents around you, know who's sticking up behind you, and expect nearly anything out of the ordinary. Carry the piece around with you enough, 
and the power of it will absorb into you to the point where you won't need it anymore. Your friends will declare you a psychic, but sometimes the weight of the power will give your body aches. Most likely you'll never meet that little boy again, but if you're one of the unlucky ones and you see him in any form, you must turn right around and run as fast and as far as you can because he wants his baseball back. Rising Boreal, the Vampire Murders Thrusting me beneath your clothing, where I may feel the throbs of your heart or rest upon your hip. Carry me when you go forth over land or sea, for thus merely touching you is enough, is best. And thus touching you would I silently sleep and be carried eternally. More than enough has been said about the winters in Chicago, known for both some of the coldest temperatures in the Midwest and as a home of historically infamous winter storms. The festive seasons, as a result, have been a point of heavy dislike and wondrous appreciation for both natives and tourists alike. Despite a lifetime here, I could barely make any solid judgments to attest to this. My numbness during these times of the year have all just been too great. All thanks to a crippling seasonal affective disorder that always left me apathetic and tired whenever snowflakes fall. Always down when the thermometers go blue, but always at least somewhat stabilized when the leaves start to grow back in spring. Medication and counseling resistant, trauma and shame protecting it like Cerberus guards hell. All I could do was merely exist, and that was just on the course of my best days. Though everything changed since that day, since I encountered solace celebrations of the most wicked kind. I've been changed, haven't I? You've changed me, haven't you? All thanks to you. Because of you, I'm now left in fractured ruins, left with a strange boutique of mixed emotions, yet even with this dread and disorientation going through me, there still exists this morbid pining. Inside the sickest layers of my being, I find myself with an unearthly desire to go back to the icy warmth of rising Boreal. The Ainsworth Inquirer days were numbered, the end of an era just around the corner. I knew it, my chain-smoking boss knew it, and even the damn janitor knew it. Yet it was all business as usual, with this dime a dozen community paper spitting out its usual garbled, tame local interest stories and obituaries. You had to still pretend everything was right or find yourself ostracized by your bosses and co-workers. The quiet stress could almost be measured by the foggy rise of on-property cigarette smoke. But this was a joyous time for me, as selfish as it is to admit. In the long term, I would be jobless, yes, but it meant I was no longer bound by the requirements and conservative expectations that come with a paper most known for reporting on Boy Scout charity drives. At the end of it, I was free of my professional chains. I could pursue an obsession of mine. Using my own expenses, the boss let me off to the crossroads of America, all to look into a series of murders that few even acknowledge. It was a quiet drive through hours, fields and fields with the occasional strip mall to interrupt it. Lost in thought, and with a busted car radio, I dwelled existentially onto my life a piss-poor child of an addicted mother who would have sold him for crack money if she could, a teenager who won a scholarship by chance and wasted it on a journalist degree he almost didn't get due to academic misconduct. A man's career, if died tomorrow, would have peaked with an awkward five-minute interview with a school board member. A barely stable manic depressive who was at the time throwing everything he could at a blood-sucking serial killer in rural Indiana. The Vampire Murders, as the Indianapolis Star coined it, are a series of strange deaths likely done by a serial killer. Victims went missing then turned up roadside on US highways to be discovered by some unexpected passerby. Autopsies showed these poor bastards 
blood were drained and their bodies almost perfectly preserved despite estimated time of deaths ranging from weeks to months before then. Veins could have been cleaned out by a damned brush from the look of it. And to make matters even more disturbing, this didn't seem to be done by any knife or medical device. Those were bite marks done by fangs. As terrifying as this is, and as much the victims deserve justice, that is not what brought me to investigate these tragedies. Because those gruesome killings had been on the down low. There had been no press conferences, public releases, or even the most basic of updates from law enforcement, local or state. Even normally greedy national and corporate media were avoiding any kind of reporting on the crimes. There were some online news articles at the occasional six minute info dump on local news stations to be sure, but as far for anything not minimal, there was a clear deliberate ignoring of the vampire murders. Normally such deaths would be front page news across the country with true crime documentaries already being greenlit. There had to be a reason for this and I, in all selfish honesty, wanted to be the one to uncover this all before my paper tanked. In hindsight, I wish I had turned the other way and headed back home. Not like I could have outrun my own destiny, but maybe I could have had at least a few more good years before I came face to face with bitter truths and forbidden fruits. In the morning, I made it to the town closest to where the last body was found. Rising, body out. Checked into a hotel before daily routines began. As the sun went up and I got a clear view at the landscape before me, I was wordless at how different this place was from the surrounding areas and just in general how eccentric of an aura it gave. Lilies, roses and even sunflowers thriving at every corner, both in flower pots and on the grass, pine trees a sight only up in the northern states dotted the woods and greasy eras amidst the town itself, all in the dead of winter with snow and ice leaving a kiss on everything. These things had to be plastic or I was misidentifying species. I shivered. Even the architecture of this place gave me a certain unease. Buildings, both homes and businesses alike, were made from picturesque bright red bricks, dark brown logs, and the whitest flattened woods one could picture. But all the while, there was almost something far too idealistic and quaint about all this. As if it was bright colouring meant to paint over blood splatter, a smiley face blanket tossed over a corpse. This beauty meant to hide something terrible. I pushed my cynicism aside and carried on. This uncanniness, this weirdness would have to wait. There was business to attend to. I often thought about the man who exists to me in only old, faint glimpses of time. My mother never told me directly what happened with my father. I had to pick it up from her slurred, drunken rant from across the years. Faggot. Candy ass. Sissy. Sodomite. When I was only halfway through kindergarten, she walked in on him in bed with another man. Kicked him out the same day. All photos she had with him in it were burned. Now all there is is fading feelings of warmth. It was all downhill for her mental state from there. My first stop was the closest shop to the hotel. The cashier was, to my luck, also the owner. A kind and jovial man who was very helpful and sometimes dodgy wherever questions arose about the odder aspects of the town. I quickly tossed the runaround side and went straight for the juggler, asking about the corpses that popped up not too far away. The colour drained from his face and the eye contact I worked so hard to establish was lost in a millisecond. He quickly but still politely pulled my requested souvenir, then showed me on my merry way, even giving it to me on the house. So no conversation over cards and cash could occur. This would become a running theme during my visit. Turned away by storekeeper to storekeeper and by passerby to passerby, I was already in a rut so soon into my trip. Perking myself with a latte, I decided yapping away was pointless and decided to make my way from that cafe to the town library. On my way, however, something caught my eye, 
right in the middle of the town center was this huge, unbloomed flower, roughly the size of a pickup, with vines intertwined with nearly everywhere in place and thing. The peculiarities of this were disturbing, as if I was witnessing the behavior of an animal belonging deep at sea or miles into the jungle, something that ought to remain away from human civilization. Benches, support beams, walls, lampposts, and all one could imagine was latched onto it. None of the shoppers and families walking by seemed to even care. Accustomed to it all, I took a deep breath and pressed on to my destination. My father was gone when I came into adulthood. My mother was emotionally never really there. Maybe this would not have been so bad if there were any parental or authority figures in my life that could have held me up high. A delinquent and worthless son of a bitch unlikely to accomplish much in life beyond pushing around carts for minimum wage. I know for the sake of self-love, I'm supposed to say they misjudged me, but now that I think about the cheated math tests, the fights I got into, and all those picked pockets, I wonder if they were right. That all good fortune was a fluke or all a part of a cruel joke. That there wasn't a place for me. At least, not in this world. A satanic cult. No name was even given for it, but they existed, and they spilt blood. A 1982 news article from the archives reported briefly about a paganistic cult in Boreal, broken up and arrested for sacrificing and killing four people at a local cave. Names of the arrested were not included, nor of anything thereafter, when it came to trials and sentencing. To add insult to injury, there was no follow-up from the paper that covered it for the rest of its lifespan. I had been at it for five hours on an ancient desktop that must have been top-end tech back in 2002, and this was all I could show for it. I rubbed my forehead and then checked my watch. I had ten minutes left before closing. An announcement from the loudspeakers soon confirmed what I already knew. While jogging off from my session, fear overtook me. I was being watched. I checked my surroundings, my eyes tracking down two smiling men staring at me from a couple of bookshelves across the room. These freaks had unnaturally pale skins and unblinking eyes that made my spine want to pop out of my body. A sadistically gleeful smirk written on their faces. I felt like I was being watched by two deformed mannequins rather than any living, breathing human being. The moment was mercifully interrupted by a librarian telling me it's time to go in that classic annoyed tone. I nodded, then looked back to see the space near the shelves empty once again. For once, in what must have been forever, my compulsion towards this godless place came upon me through a common sense gut punch. I had to leave this town before it was too late. Later that night, I threw my things haphazardly into the back of my car and started to hightail it out of town. Didn't even bother to get my money back for the days paid for what would be unused. I barely obeyed traffic laws as I made it into the town's outskirts. That is, as far as I went before fate reared its ugly head. I saw them. All those lights in the woods. Many, many torchlights in the distance to the left of me. I parked on the side of the road, numbing myself to my own inner voices and headed out on foot. I pushed through many bushes and clumps of snow before I finally hit a man-made path. Those were not far away, those unseen devils calling to me in their mystery and danger. A mere minute later, I was hunched down in a bush. I started observing these velvet-robed figures grouped together and slowly, few by few, heading inside this cave. The same cave mentioned in the article. When there was only one cultist behind their congregation, I prepped myself and firmly grasped a nearby rock. In a flash, I was standing over the body of said man now with a bashed-in head. No matter where one falls on the debate of how human sexuality forms, be it environment, genetics, mixture of the two, or none of the above, I can tell you that my dad was not the first gay man in my family. My great-great-grandfather frequented an underground gay bar shortly after the depression lifted. A man he thought he was going to get lucky with turned out to be an undercover cop. Some months later, he was institutionalized against his will, then half-heartedly lobotomized doomed to spend the remaining decades of his life in a home. I remembered visiting him 
shortly before his death in 2001. Even at that young age, I knew that I was witnessing a living tragedy. He had spent the better part of his life not as himself, but as a mental child who couldn't even control his own bowel movements. This man was once a lively and kind man, given a fate worse than death, all for liking guys. Maybe if he was white, he would have been given a slap on the wrist. The screams of that poor girl echoed through my mind, crying, pleading, and praying to God. He didn't hear her. Pulling the ceremonial clothing from that body, I disguised myself as one of their ranks and got with them in time to bear witness to this horrible act. I watched a bearded man in a blue robe sucking the life out of this woman through these horrific teeth, right until there was none left. When she was no longer on this earth, the crowd gave a foreign chant that I did my best to mouth along with. A couple of mooks disposed of the body as the man addressed the crowd, speaking of strange things to his people, of freedom, superiority, and salvation from this cruel world. Then my cover was blown, if I even had it to start with. We have a visitor tonight, my children. My heart sank down deep and my body froze in place. I thought this was going to be the end of me. I expected the men surrounding me to grab me and put me onto the now crimson stained concrete slab. They didn't. Instead, a plain clothed man stepped onto the stage. I was in complete shock, not just because it was the same man I thought I had just killed, but it was also an all too familiar, all too desired face from a lifetime ago. Damn. My father gave me an almost sickeningly affectionate smile, an unnaturally long snake-like tongue licking up the unnaturally coloured blood from his forehead. No harm or no fool it seemed, the mad priest gave a laugh before placing a warm and romantic kiss on my father's lips. I could feel the emotional resonance from the act despite how far away I stood, my dad embracing his lawfully wedded husband of the winter times. I wanted to run to drive away and never come back, but the fanged fiends of this evil religion blocked all exits with their increasingly unnatural vitality. The priest stepped forward from his lover and faced the crown, and with a nod communicated that it was time. After praying some deities of old, he, oh, I can't come up with the words, Lord help us all, I can barely describe what happened next. There are just some sights, sensations and universal truths that the English language simply cannot do justice for. Horrible, horrible things that can never be truly rationalized and accepted by the human brain. In what fractured pictures of time that I can pull from my subconscious, I witness the priest do a metamorphosis that spat in the face of Mother Nature herself. He turned into something that was far too powerful to be a mere vampire. Turned into something far too beautiful for anything that two-bit American folklore could ever come up with. Before I lost consciousness, there was a noise emitting from my mouth. To this day, I can't tell if it was screaming or laughing. I remember seeing the flower before I left, that fauna from a different world, a different time and a different dimension. I don't know if I ran past it while running away from the cavern or if I saw it while being carried by those unholy holy men. But I know I saw it sometime before I woke up in my hotel room the following day. I vividly recall that it had blossomed to the joys and cheers of gathered locals. That it was glowing a celestial blue that seemed to be reaching out to the heavens itself. Its strangeness blessings, the falling snow like one might see inside the painting of a gentle madman. I swear up into this very day that I saw ghostly visages dancing among the snow-stricken sky that night. Mail has piled up at the front door. Phone calls have stayed unanswered. Without hesitation, I have cut off anyone who remotely cared about me. It was the best route since even if I tried my damnness, there was no way in hell I was going to be close with another human being ever again. Not after what I've seen. Not after finding out what I am. Sanity's sun will never shine on me again. I am left in a cold, growing shadow engulfing all peace of mind and homo sapien sensibilities, and all I did was scratch the surface about what is waiting for us in the wintry darkness. What dreams may come, 
what suffering too imaginable and what pleasure too savage. And what familiar faces may already be frolicking in a garden of weirdness, all ready to guide me into the next planetary steps. There are very little ways out now. I can either allow myself to wither away into oblivion for the sake of some undeserving affinity to mankind, or I can take from the frozen olive branch offered to me by gods of eons, past, so that I may live in a new reality. Somewhere for the first time in my life, I may have a loving family. Somewhere I truly belong. A dark poem titled The Hollow Men, written in 1925. We are the hollow men, we are the stuffed men, leaning together, headpiece filled with straw. Alas, our dry voices, when we whisper together, are quiet and meaningless as wind in dry grass, or rat's feet over broken glass in our dry cellar. Shapes without form, shade without color, paralyzed force, gesture without motion. Those who have crossed with direct eyes to death's other kingdom, remember us, if at all, not as lost. Violent souls, but only as the hollow men, the stuffed men. Eyes I dare not meet in dreams, in death's dream kingdom, these do not appear. There, the eyes are sunlight on a broken column. There is a tree swinging and voices are in the winds, singing, more distant and more solemn than a fading star. Let me be no nearer in death's dream kingdom. Let me also wear such deliberate disguises, rat's coat, crow skin, crossed stars in a field. Behaving as the wind behaves, no nearer. Not that final meeting in the Twilight Kingdom. This is the dead land. This is the cactus land. Here the stone images are raised. Here they receive the suffocation of a dead man's hand under the twinkle of a fading star. Is it like this in depths of the kingdom? Walking alone at the hour when we are trembling with tenderness. Lips that would kiss from prayers to broken stone. The eyes are not here. There are no eyes here. In this valley of dying stars, in this hollow valley, this broken jaw of our lost kingdoms. In this last of meeting places, we grope together and avoid speech gathered on this beach of the Tumid River. Sightless unless the eyes reappear as the perpetual star, multifolia drones of death's twilight kingdom, the hope only of empty men. Between the idea and the reality, between the motion and the act, falls the shadow, for thine is the kingdom. Between the conception and the creation, between the emotion and the response, falls the shadow. Life is very long. Between the desire and the spasm, between the potency and the existence, between the essence and the descent, Falls the shadow, for thine is the kingdom, for thine is, life is, for thine is the... This is the way the world ends, this is the way the world ends, this is the way the world ends. Not with a bang, but a whimper. He stalks the inner being of time. In the darkest pit lurks the most ruined life. He stalks the inner being of time. He is alone and knows it bitterly true. I pity him, and can relate with his ills. For I too have lost much to his power. Oh, how I love to face this wretch, to combat him on a higher plane, to engage him at his titillating game. He reaches into my heart, and from out my desires he pulls my soul. Naked and alone, I cannot defeat you. Darkness, you desire to consume me. My tongue, you wish to preach your hate. You attack me, for you desire a vessel for your earthly work. Nay, 
I deny you this, but in truth what defense have I? To the divinity that swarms about me, I appeal, appeal. But what cold metal embrace do I feel? Wretch, craven, what business have thee here? I desire love, but it feels as though it is beyond me. Desperate, I pray for salvation from impurity. Nay, but to still, salvation from inequity. For it is my falling short of your dreams that force you to force me to fall short of mine. And in dreams this wretch lives forever. For dreams are but distant wishes, hopes for a brighter tomorrow. And in these hopes darkness lurks, desiring to encumber he who dares to dream. To inspect and infect him, inoculate him with all the ills and worries of fear, and when the dirges of hope forgotten take their toll, he reaps, oh, he reaps. Up your back his fingers creep, and he shushes with a whisper, and you are alone again. Wake up, dreamer. There is no more time. Make real that which you seek. Then, and then alone, does the nightmare go away. The House Tis a grove-circled dwelling, set close to a hill, where the branches are telling strange legends of ill, over times so old that they breathe of the dead, crawl the vines green and cold, by strange nourishment fed, and no man knows the juices they suck from the depths of their dark, slimy bed. In the gardens are growing tall blossoms and fair, each pallid bloom throwing perfume on the air. But the afternoon sun, with its shining red rays, makes the picture loom done on the curious gaze, and above the sweet scent of the blossoms rise odors of numberless days. The rank grasses are waving on terrace and lawn, dim memories savoring of things that have gone. The stones of the walks are encrusted and wet, and a strange spirit stalks when the red sun has set, and the soul of the watchers is filled with faint pictures he fain would forget. It was in the hot June time I stood by that scene, when the gold rays of noontime beat bright on the green. But I shivered with cold, groping feebly for light, as a picture unrolled, and my age spanning sight. So the time I'd been there before flashed like folgery out of the night. The Ballad of Loneliness With your life on the edge, broken and beaten by hunger, I solemnly made a pledge to treat you like a brother. You likened yourself to a sickness, that you were nothing short of a sin. Your name was Loneliness, and I was Tarin. What spiteful words, tossed around like a toy, calming you down took a while, but did my heart jump to joy when I saw a month-old smile. It had started to rain. With it, brought forth your curse. You were in agonizing pain from an outsider's source. With my best friend covered in wound and blood, I had not failed to give you my best, with warm tears my eyes started to flood when I realized you had to be put to rest. In the light of a dying moon, I knew that I was your only friend. As you walked to your tomb, you knew that this would not be the end. And although you coexisted with strife, behind self-hatred you were compassionate. You had lived a short life filled with neglect and abandonment. I cannot begin to imagine the pain you've been through. And although nothing has changed since, I won't and will never leave you. Good night, my little prince. Well, listeners, I hope you enjoyed tonight's set of tales. Rising Boreal, The Vampire Murders was written by Audrey Uwu, a story that I can't help feeling is inspired by H.P. Lovecraft narratives, the plotline where the main character discovers who they are, and more importantly, what they are, being that they ain't entirely human. Perhaps their own version of an insmith look. He stalks the inner being of time, discusses concepts of fate, one's own timeline, the road to the end of life and its meaning. The House, the tale written by H.P. Lovecraft, is about the passage of time, the world around oneself, and taking in your surroundings. The Ballad of Loneliness, written by Flaky Porcupine, explores isolation, angst, desperation, hopelessness, but also friendship. And lastly, The Hollow Men, explores the themes of futility, and that one was written all the way back in 1925. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's episode, and if you have any suggestions or feedback, reach out to me via email on storiesfablesghostlytales at gmail.com. Don't forget to subscribe on your podcast player, so you can hear my voice in your ear three times a week, 
Monday is always old time radio remastered shows where I tweak and repair all the old school audio to modern day standards, whilst Wednesday and Thursday are my storytelling days. Lastly, if you think you're able to support me in what I do, visit my Patreon page at www.patreon.com forward slash SFGT and you can support me there via monthly donations. In saying that, I don't run ads and I never will. And I'll never use paywalls. I do this because I love it and any love sent my way is greatly appreciated. Now for those lovelies that send the support my way in the first place, this is my time to thank you brilliant people. First up is my Ode Knight T Titan, the always lovely and always majestic Queen of the Cats, Maya. Mate, I was on the verge of pulling my hair out the last two weeks as I recorded and recorded and constantly would pick up pops and clicks in my recordings. It was kind of like working in my own Twilight version of an old time radio episode. I'd record, I'd go back and listen to it, and there was definitely no clicks in my pronunciations or recordings, but yet there it was. And I have to cut it out or redo the entire line altogether. Super frustrating. I couldn't figure out what the issue was, so I used D-clickers and band-aid fixes to resolve the pops and clicks, but it was only temporary. So I had an idea to replace the connector between my computer and my Blue Yeti. Then boom, at least so far, it's completely fixed. I've bought a couple of more adapters to ensure that I don't run out of backups. But thanks to you, my audio stress levels are zero again. Thanks, Maya, for your support. It means buying parts to keep my recordings clean are no longer an issue. So thank you very, very, very much. You're keeping me sane. <laughs> My white tea warlord, Lazarus Maximus, mate, thank you for your support, Dudio, and I've used your donations to fund the purchasing of both the D-clicking and specialized D-reverb plugins for my audio. Sometimes my room gets a little bit echoey as a result of where I record, and also there are clocks in the background that click and tick away. I don't mind them, but I don't want them obviously in the recordings, so thanks to you, I can use those plugins to cut them out without a hassle. Thank you immensely, mate. You're bloody awesome. Pages Smartus Illicentia. Mate, thank you for your support, Page. Thanks to you, I've been able to renew a license that I use for audio improvements and have been able to use your donations to cover some of the costs for upgrading to the next set of tools. I'm always looking at ways to improve the show, and as a result, you'll be hearing changes in the audio already, thanks to your support. I've also been able to use Patreon support for voice modification software, which you would have heard in today's episode. If you, supporters, or listeners have any feedback regarding the voice changes, let me know. And thank you, Paige, for your ongoing support. And never forget that you're brilliant. And the peeps that put a bounce, hop, and a skippity pep in my step, my old gray enforcers I am lucky to have. Chad Warren, Joss Heather, Juicebox Andy, Peter Raffelli, Dolphin and Cow, Michelangelo, Yokone, Tea Time Drinker 1, and Divided by Zero. Thank you all, have a wonderful Friday, and stick with me Monday for more old-time radio from the Sherlock Holmes series, as well as a Wednesday and Friday set of horror tales. As always, mates, till next we meet.